Great, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Denny Chan. I am the Managing Director for Equity Advocacy at Justice and Aging. Um, I wanna first start off by thanking LAC for organizing today's training um, as a former board member for LAC. And uh, I am very a proud supporter of LAC's work and the mission of the organization. Um, Justice Naging is a proud member of LAC. Um, and I also wanna thank all of you for giving up your lunch times to join us um, for this presentation today on advancing equity for older adults through law and policy. Um, I know that there's been a lot of really bad weather <laughs> across the state, so I hope all of you are staying safe and dry. Um, so Justice Naging, in case you haven't heard of us, we are a national legal advocacy organization that is dedicated to using the power of law to fight senior poverty. And we focus on several key areas, including healthcare, economic security, um, and in that economic security bucket, a growing amount of work around housing, as well as um, projects focused on elder rights. Um, and we have focused our efforts since 1972 on uh, populations of older adults who have been historically marginalized and excluded from justice, including older women, older adults of color, LGBTQ plus older adults, and older adults with limited English proficiency. We are a support center for um, legal services providers. So if you want access to our trainings and our materials, feel free to join our network. Um, you can do that very easily, justicenaging.org. And then there is a um, sign up button, or you can send an email to info at justicenaging.org. Um, we provide free trainings and materials. Um, and I we are very judicious about um, the amount of email we send, we know that people get a lot of email and you always have the option to unsubscribe or filter out um, what you want to get. So um, Justice Naging, before I dive into sort of the meat and potatoes of today's presentation, we are an organization that is dedicated and um, committed to advancing equity in our work. Um, in the spring of last year, we launched an, an equity initiative um, to advance equity for low-income older adults in the key program areas across our organization. Um, you know, our commitment to ending senior poverty means that we have to really recognize and grapple with the ways in which poverty is racialized in this country and how they are, they enjoy a complicated relationship but are not always synonymous. Um, and that means that we have to address the enduring harms and inequities caused by systemic racism and other forms of discrimination that impact the older adults who we serve. And that commitment starts at home um, within the organization. We have a commitment to recruit, support, and retain a diverse staff and board of directors among many different types of diversity that are identified here on this slide. And that's actually a great plug. Um, we currently are hiring right now in Justice for Justice and Aging. Um, for three different positions. So if you are interested and want to learn more, feel free to go on our website um, and find those job postings. Um, at least one of them is specific to California. So you all are a great bunch to help us get the word out and also think about whether you'd like to join us in our work. All right, so this might seem like a completely random picture, but this is a picture of a lake um, that is about five minutes from where my parents live um, off of the shores of West Michigan, Lake Michigan, um, called Spring Lake. And this is the hometown where I grew up. And the reason why I start this presentation on equity and aging is because the topic really is quite personal for me. So this here is a picture of me, um, my mom and my sister, as well as my grandma. Um, and the work here is personal. I think oftentimes we think about policy work, we think about law and we can forget about the people who are behind those laws and the people who are on these programs, who get help from these programs and rely on these programs every day to make ends meet. And so when I think about this work in, uh, my life, as well as the work that we're doing across the organization, I think about people like my grandmother, who is uh, dually eligible. She's still um, she celebrated last year her 90th birthday, um, but she's dually eligible. She's on all the programs that we fight for and that we 
um, you know, want to create more access to. Um, she is happily living in the community um, with the help of home community-based services. Um, so all this is to say that the work and the things that I'm going to be talking about often are statistics and programs and policies, um, but it's really important um, both in our work and for me personally to remember that there are people behind these programs um, who are touched by these programs every day. Um, and advancing equity in these programs means advancing equity and improving their lives. All right, so the first chapter in the first section of this presentation is really focused on unpacking um, what I call massive inequities in how we age. And there's two different ways in which that shows up. Um, and I'm gonna give you sort of the two ways plus a couple of different examples of how it shows up in people's lives. Um, and the first really is, is focused on ageism. Um, that is the specific devaluing of lives based on um, someone's age. Um, and the second is what I'm gonna call sort of intersectional discrimination. Um, that is racism and other forms of dis systemic discrimination combined with age um, to uniquely disadvantage older adults who come from these um, historically discriminated against and under underrepresented backgrounds. Um, and the two operate in slightly different ways. Um, and I think it's really important that we unpack both of those because when we think about how law and policy can advance equity for older adults, we really have to be thinking about programs that help and advance solutions for, um, for both of these types of inequities, both of these buckets. So on the first bucket, um, which is ageism, the devaluing of older adults um, simply because of their age, there is a lot that we can point to, unfortunately. Um, so this is a headline from Business Insider. And the headline just from September of last year reads, our government has never been older than it is today. Here are the costs benefits and dangers of a U.S. led by old people. Um, and so this is, you know, really quite bold. And even in the headline itself, you can start to think through <laughs> um, the sort of fear that it's in some ways trying to generate among people, among its audience, um, the costs, the benefits, the dangers um, of a U.S. led by old, old people. And it's hard to imagine any other group, um, if you replace you know, the age piece with any other protected class, it's hard to imagine um, a headline that could be so bold um, for other protected classes, for other different other types of identities. Um, and I think it shows you how in many ways ageism in our society is quite naked. It's quite um, forward and people are unabashedly um, ageist in how they think. It's not just though in our headlines, um, it has a real world impact on older adults across the country. So um, going on the media theme, this is a uh, snapshot taken from a New York Times article that was published during the fall um, during the brunt of Hurricane Ian, where of course in parts of Florida and parts of the Carolinas, there was lots of damage and heartache um, and the title of the article reads, Our Bubble Has Been Burst, Older Storm Victims Face an Uncertain Future. The subtitle reads, Retirees Displaced by Hurricane Ian Confront a Wretching Situation at Their Age, Remaking the Lives They Love So Much in Florida May Not Be Possible. I mean, the article really unpacks the ways in which this natural disaster, which we think would harm everyone equally, actually had a sort of different impact. Um, for older adults, both with respect to who died, as well as the challenges that older adults faced upon surviving. Um, so for the death information of the 126 victims of the storm, um, at the time of the, the article, at least in October, 96 of those people were identified, and at least 70 of those people were 60 years or older. But it wasn't just about people who died. It was also about the ways in which ageism uh, or older adults were, were faced unique challenges, um, even if they survived the storm. 
A lot of their insurance policies were canceled due to the old age of their homes and then times profiled individuals who um, had that happen to them. And as well as a number of individuals who um, really found themselves in a different situation than when they bought their houses decades ago um, because they were in a place where they really economically couldn't rebuild their houses because the costs had skyrocketed so much since they had purchased their homes in a way that you know younger buyers would not have faced those types of challenges. Those challenges changed as the sort of market um, evolved um, and the Times did a really good job of profiling how this impacted older adults in the state. Another way, of course, um, it, it's hard to talk about older adults without talking about COVID, um, but we see that 60, for, for individuals who are 65 and up, they account for a much larger share of COVID-19 deaths than those who are under 65. Um, you know, this is a graphic from the Kaiser Family Foundation that illustrates throughout COVID, um, the deaths of the, Share, the share of COVID-19 deaths for people who are 65 and up has been significantly higher. Um, and it's kind of ebbed and waned, but it's always been um, more than 50%. Um, and even more recent reports, this was taken in October of last year, uh, later reports in November and December indicate that even as many as nine out of 10 COVID deaths are among those people who are 65 and up. Um, and it continues to be troubling because less than a third of people who are 65 and up across the country have received their bivalent booster, um, the most recent booster that specifically um, helps protect against Omicron, even though as studies continue to show that the efficacy um, for that booster, the bivalent booster, um, is quite high in preventing death among older adults and hospitalization among older adults. Um, and so, you know, you might be sitting there thinking, well, Denny, you know, this is, is this really ageism? This is just kind of how things work. This is kind of how, what happens when your body gets older, you are more susceptible um, to illness. Um, and that generally, you know, to some extent is true, but it's not really the end of the inquiry. Um, throughout COVID-19, we saw many different ways in which the lives of older adults were devalued. Um, and that wasn't just on account of science. So this next slide shows you, there's a lot of text I know on this slide. Um, and I'm just gonna take a minute to walk through some background, um, which is that this slide is real life language. So it was real language taken from a draft policy known as a um, crisis standard of care. Um, and these crises standards of care were issued across the country um, from state departments of public health during COVID-19 to um, hospitals and different healthcare systems. Crisis standards of care are guidance documents that help um, providers when they are, you know, administering services to figure out how to ration care, essentially. Um, in other words, when you are down to that last ventilator or the last hospital bed, and you have multiple patients who could benefit from that scarce resource, how do you decide who gets that last bed? Um, and so these crisis standards of care um, help answer that question. They were issued throughout the country, um, lots of different crisis standards of care, um, but all many of them followed a, uh, a draft or sort of a template. Um, so many of them look the same. And so this was taken from a state's I will not name the state, but it, it was taken from a state's standard um, of care. Um, and so it walked through this sort of elaborate scoring formula um, where you would sort of give people points based on different considerations. And then it said, you know, after you do the scoring formula, which is known as the SOFA score, if you get a tie, how do you break that tie? And so what this state proposed, in addition to a number of other states, were life cycle considerations. Um, so life cycle considerations, they say, should be used as a tiebreaker if there are not enough resources to provide all patients within a priority group with, and then it's very explicit, priority going to younger patients. It is a valuable goal to give individuals equal opportunity to pass through the stages of life. 
And then it attempts to justify this policy. Um, this does not rely on considerations of one's intrinsic worth or social utility. Rather, younger individuals receive priority because they have had the least opportunity to live through life stages. When individuals are asked to consider situations of absolute scarcity of life sustaining resources, most believe younger patients should be prioritized over older ones. And so I've, you know, the highlight here has been added by yours truly. Um, but I think it goes to illustrate the ways in which younger patients would be preferred um, if, there, if it came down to a tie. And oftentimes, you know, just to show you how arbitrary some of this could be, the life cycle considerations, um, you could be deciding between getting, giving that ventilator or that bed to someone who was 55 as opposed to someone who was 60. Um, and so, you know, it, medically speaking, they might be similarly situated, but they were using age as a tiebreaker. And I think sort of the double whammy here is that last part, which is that, well, if you ask most people, most people would think that younger people should be prioritized over older ones. Again, it is really hard to imagine a case where um, and it's attempting to use people's commonly held ageist beliefs to justify ageist policy. And it's really hard to imagine another situation where um, if you switched out the different identity category, um, where this would be just as accepted. Um, so we worked with the state, um, the unknown state, uh, our unidentified state to rectify this um, and to, to ultimately release a crisis standard of care that was much more, uh, much less ageist on its face. Um, but these were popping up across the country as many hospital systems were going into, um, going into sort of triage mode and deciding who would get what resource. Um, and so we, in addition to other, a number of other advocacy organizations filed complaints um, with Health and Human Services, the US Department of Health and Human Services to challenge these policies. Um, but it shows you how commonly held beliefs, ageist beliefs um, can show up in policy. So it's not just about, you know, older adults potentially being more frail and more susceptible to COVID. We saw even in the policy response to COVID that um, ageism crept in. Um, and then the other piece of course is outside of age is the way in which age works with other forms of systemic discrimination to compound over the lifetime. Um, and here, this is a graphic taken from a, a CMS document that illustrates the number of Medicare beneficiaries um, who were hospitalized with COVID-19 per 100,000. Um, and, and CMS updated these regularly throughout the, the pandemic. Um, and oftentimes what people would say then, you know, um, to me is, well, Denny, isn't this largely then an issue around um, class um, in terms of income, in terms of access? Um, you know, we, we know that people who were uh, less economically secure would have, um, would be more susceptible to the virus um, and the income and the outcomes of the virus. And that's true to some extent, except what this does is what I didn't leave, what I left off is the blue and yellow bars. What do they mean? Well, the blue bars here are people who are um, Medicare only. In, in other words, they have only Medicare as their payer. And the yellow bars are people who are duly eligible with Medicare and Medicaid. Um, in other words, they are, are um, both 65 and up and or have a qualifying disability and um, are low, low income enough to receive Medicaid. And so it's clear that old age, you know, would make people more susceptible. Also clear that uh, economically insecure folks would be susceptible to hospi being hospitalized from COVID-19. And then the intersection of that across racial groups is even more profound. So you can see then, of course, that the hospitalization rates for um, American Indian, Alaska Native, for Black and African American, um, for, his, for Hispanic, are significantly higher than the hospitalization rates for um, white Medicare beneficiaries 
and Asian, Asian Pacific Islander beneficiaries. Um, and that's even looking just at Medicare or Medicare only, or just at people who are duly eligible. In other words, the impact of someone's socioeconomic status does not clearly explain everything that's happening. Um, and so we know that over the lifetime of an older adult, the inequities and the discrimination that they experience and that they face compound such that we get these types of outcomes. There was also a lot during um, COVID, of course, about the outbreak um, and the outbreaks of COVID in nursing facilities. And um, to no one's immediate surprise, the higher proportion of residents of color, the more likely um, of an outbreak and unfortunately subsequent hospitalization as well as death. All of this is a result of compounding systemic discrimination. Um, and it's true outside of COVID. Black older adults have higher rates of diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. They also have higher rates of disability relative to white older adults. Um, and those are you know, resulting from health inequities that build up over someone's life. Um, the impact of a lifetime of discrimination in healthcare um, so that comes in lots of different forms. It's also true outside of health. Um, if we think about the ways in which this is tied to income and economic security, um, you know, women typically make less money than men, um, which generates in less available income and savings in retirement compared to men. Um, and so it's a double whammy, another double whammy. On the one hand, you um, end up making less as a, as a woman um, for the same type of work. And so you're paid less in the present. And then because our system that, you know, our system of, of retirement is based on how much you put in, um, you are also then paid less when you retire. Um, and so that I think is a really good example of how this ends up compounding over the lifetime. Um, and, you know, so, while the median earning for women in 2021 was 83.1%, that of men, they're getting less in the present and then they're going to get less as a function of that because of the smaller amount that they put into the system. Um, and that's even just for women as a whole. If you break down how that looks specifically for specific groups of women, we think we, we're talking about for Black women, um, a lifetime loss of earnings totaling nearly $1 million. For Latina women, $1.1 million. Um, and again, that shows you that impact of the intersectional discrimination here, you know, focused on older women and then specifically older women of color. Um, it also has an everyday impact in terms of how people think about getting their care or um, don't think about getting their care. You know, a Commonwealth study released just last year showed that one out of four Black and Latino older adults, and they define older adults here as 60 and up, report not being taken seriously by healthcare professionals because of their race. More than a quarter of older adults said that they did not get care or treatment because of discrimination. So that, you know, really shows you from a overall statistical thinking the impact of these systems of discrimination. Um, and that can help explain some of the trends that we discussed earlier around higher rates of disability for older black adults. And then, you know, to think, take things back to COVID, not to make this entirely a COVID presentation, but we also saw um, the real world impacts um, for individuals who are older during the pandemic when it came time to roll out the vaccines. If you remember back in late December, um, late fall, December of 2020, we first started administering vaccines and um, in some ways that were you know, anti-ageist ended up prioritizing older adults given the risk that older adults um, have from getting COVID. But that prioritization, lots of states who ended up prioritizing older adults first in the queue um, in some ways was rendered meaningless um, because it wasn't friendly for older adults to get the vaccine. Um, so here are two headlines 
and um, one taken from Cal Matters and the other taken from um, the Washington Post um, that kind of explain examples of ways in which the COVID um, vaccine response, um, although had prioritized older adults, left them still without shots in arms. So the first headline reads, without a ride, many in need have no shot at coronavirus vaccine. And the second, California rolled out websites and apps to fight COVID-19, did they work? Um, and what you know, federal policymakers and state policymakers witnessed and what we all saw really was um, that lots of people without transportation, without who were limited English proficient, who didn't have access to technology, um, really couldn't get a shot. Um, I remember, you know, we were getting inquiries from folks in California saying that they were working with ad older adults who needed um, vaccines administered at home. Um, they could not get to a vaccine center. And, you know, these are like the people who are some of the most at risk um, given their chronic conditions, <clears throat> limited mobility, likely um, lower economic um, status. And there was no answer for those individuals. Um, in, for, for a long time, the state really struggled um, given the way the science worked behind the vaccine, the storage requirements, how quickly they had, they had to be administered. All of that made it really challenging. Um, and it ultimately left people for many, many months waiting to get a vaccine. Um, I also remember when, you know, LA County, for example, um, first launched their vaccine program. Um, they had a website where you could fill out and register for an appointment. And then they also had hotline. Um, and if you weren't going to rely on the website to get an appointment, good luck getting through the hotline. Um, I know uh, we had reports of older adults who just gave up um, because it was too hard to get through um, the hotline. There was too much demand. And so all of this, I think, highlights the ways in which we, as a result of ageism and other forms of discrimination, um, build systems then that don't that don't consider all the different ways in which people need services and access services. And then ultimately, even when we decide we should prioritize a group because they are at higher risk, it still leaves, it, it, it sort of renders that prioritization somewhat meaningless because only the people who have access and means end up getting, um, getting the service, um, and for us as you know, legal aid attorneys, oftentimes those are people who are not our clients. Um, so the next chapter after sort of unpacking how these inequities work for older adults and um, specifically those who face systemic discrimination is really thinking through and, and discussing opportunities through law and policy. Um, so here I have two images. The first is really thinking about how the civil rights movement has advanced equity for communities across the country. Um, the civil rights movement, you know, as a as a flashback, there were a number of laws passed that would help end discrimination. Um, and none of those focused on age, right? So um, in 1967, you have the Age Discrimination Employment Act that was specific to age discrimination in, in the employment setting, but that was followed only a couple of years later in 1975 by the Age Discrimination Act, um, which prohibited, prohibited age discrimination more broadly. Fast forward, um, you know, you, there's also section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, which prohib prohibits discrimination in healthcare. Um, it is the only federal law that prohibit, to prohibits discrimination in healthcare that's specific, excuse me, to the healthcare setting. Um, and it does so on a number of different bases, including age um, and new regulations promulgated by the um, Biden administration um, include a more intersectional frame and thinking around how discrimination works, which is great news um, given the Commonwealth report that I talked about earlier um, that discussed older adults um, who are Latino or Black really feeling discriminated against, Section 1557 can be an important tool. Um, so the civil rights movement, whether it's 
it, you know, from decades before or how we're thinking about civil rights now um, has a place in advancing equity and has presents lots of different opportunities to advance equity for older adults who face discrimination. And certainly when we were challenging the um, crisis standards of care, we use Section 1557 and the Age Discrimination Act um, to really file challenges, to file complaints with um, Health and Human Services to try and get these unlawful crisis standards of care off the book. Um, there's also, of course, the safety net programs that many public interest attorneys and many um, legal services attorneys work on on a regular basis. Um, we often don't talk about the historical role that safety net programs have had to advance equity for older adults. And they continue to have that legacy and that impact. So for example, um, I have one of the pictures here is the Medicare insurance card. Um, and what many people either don't talk about or don't um, aren't as familiar with is that Medicare actually helped integrate um, the nation's healthcare system during the civil rights movement. Um, by threatening to withhold federal funding from any hospital that practiced racial discrimination um, as a requirement of Title VI under the Civil Rights Act, um, Medicare forced the desegregation of every hospital in America almost overnight. Um, and even in the North, where the situation was um, relatively better, Medicare helped Black physicians get privileges to practice at hospitals and also um, uh, helped with white physicians um, not pressuring black patients to go to other institutions, often county hospitals. Um, so people don't know that about the Medicare program, but it has played an important role in advancing equity um, for older adults and um, an important chapter in our nation's history in integrating um, the healthcare system. And even today, the Social Security program helps lift up so many older adults out of poverty. Um, including 9.5 million women. Without the Social Security program, poverty among older Latinos um, and older Blacks would skyrocket. It would go from 45% for Latinos, uh, I'm sorry, from 16% for Latinos to 45%. Um, and for Black older adults, it would go from 17.1% to 48%. Um, so here again, you know, is really thinking about the opportunities for safety net programs to continue to advance equity. Um, and on that note, I'm going to transition now to talking about some opportunities on the federal horizon um, that can really help advance equity for older adults. The first is Executive Order 13985. This is uh, one of the first executive orders that President Biden signed um, upon coming into office, and it is the executive order to advance equity um, through government. Um, and here, you know, this is an opportunity because this is an ongoing um, directive under the Biden administration um, that seeks to advance equity, specifically race equity, with, um, through the way that government works, through lots of different sort of um, actions, including asking every executive agency to um, sort of come up with an equity action plan in how they will further equity in the way that they deliver services um, to, to Americans. And one of the opportunities, and I think in some ways we'll see whether it was a missed opportunity, is that the executive order, um, you know, in, in a lot of its work, has not talked about how older adults of color um, could be impacted or how executive agencies um, could really be thinking about ways in which that unique intersection of age and race come up for um, older adults of color trying to navigate government services. Um, and unfortunately, because that hasn't really been part of the executive order, it then has really meant that the equity action plans that agencies have come up with don't really talk about that either. Um, so unfortunately, that may be a missed opportunity, although, you know, because it's a current directive, um, we continue to do advocacy with the Biden administration to consider the ways in which um, Executive Order 13985 can be used to advance equity for older adults 
Um, there's a couple other examples here. I also want to make sure that we talk about some of the state ones. So I'm just going to talk about the Older Americans Act regulations. Um, you know, the Administration for Community Living released um, a request for information in um, advance of um, circulating uh, draft regulations for comment. And so that will be another opportunity to ensure that um, the specific needs and, op and opportunities to advance equity for older adults is considered through that rulemaking process, which is um, about to kick off. We also have a lot of different opportunities at the state level. Um, and here, you know, there's quite a few first beginning, of course, with the master plan for aging. Um, this is a 10 year, you know, project under the um, Newsom administration to better serve older Californians and um, in it includes a goal specific to advancing equity for older adults and older Californians throughout the state. Um, so there's an entire work group as well as a scope of work. Um, on the 20th of this month, the Department of Aging will be releasing the next round of its initiatives and goals under the master plan. Um, and we expect to see um, both equity baked in throughout as well as specific goals that will focus on advancing equity for older Californians. Um, of course, there's Cal AIM, which is the um, state's attempt to rehaul basically the Medicaid program in the state um, with lots of different opportunities and touch points for older adults, including the integration or rather the transition from um, the Cal MediConnect program to um, an aligned decent model um, and as well as um, the carbon throughout the state of long-term care um, to manage care. All those I think presents very interesting questions of how to further advance equity um, in those and in the contracts um, that you know managed care plans have with um, the state and in the, um, the state contract. Um, also, of course, as a part of CalAIM is um, enhanced case management and, communities and um, community supports. And so really big questions of how those services can be used to advance equity for older adults and specifically lift up and address the needs of older adults who face historical discrimination. Um, similar to President Biden's executive order, President, uh, not President, Governor Newsom um, this fall uh, signed executive order N1622, which is also a government um, executive order uh, focused on equity. And here, because of um, where we are sort of in the development of that uh, executive order and the implementation of the, develop the executive order, there are some more opportunities um, to make sure that aging is considered as a part of equity. Um, the executive order calls for the creation of a race equity commission. And so we as aging advocates have been fighting to try and get someone who um, can think about the ways in which racial disparities and racial inequities compound over the lifetime appointed to that commission um, and other opportunities um, through N1622. DHCS has been um, busy putting together an LTSS dashboard um, around long-term services and supports, and they have an upcoming event around um, home and community-based services and the gap analysis. Both of these from DHCS present opportunities specifically to think about and look at how older adults from marginalized communities are or are not getting home and community-based services and long-term services and supports. I know that the first dashboard, um, first iteration of the dashboard has lots and lots of data and that future iterations of that dashboard will really start to incorporate a more intersectional frame. Um, so those are opportunities in the state as well as, you know, we at Justice Aging have been championing a rental subsidy for older adults um, that my colleague Patty Prunhuber has been working on. Um, and of course, we know that homelessness and issues of housing insecurity are of great importance to the state. And um, given, of course, the relationship between poverty and race, that a lot of times that ends up disproportionately hurting um, older Californians of color. So the rental subsidy would be one helpful policy lever um, in, in fighting that housing insecurity. 
And um, I will also say included in your materials today um, is that we included a, uh, our framework around advancing equity um, that Justice Naging launched um, for our equity initiative last year. Um, and so that is available for, for your review and also to think about at least how we think about advancing equity for older adults. And I encourage you all to look at that and think about opportunities in your program, um, whether it's service delivery or internally in your culture and your policies and your um, practices about how you can advance equity I'm um, specifically thinking about that intersection between age and other types of identities that have faced discrimination. All right, with that, I think we are um, we are good for questions. It looks like there are some questions in the chat from earlier, Denny. I can I can read them out for you if you'd like. Let's see. Someone asked um, why the preference to keep the state private. Um, it's only because I didn't think it's the <laughs> the point here was to learn from that state's ages policy or draft policy. The point wasn't to put any specific state on blast and also um, lots of states had problematic language, so I think it makes sense to just not identify the state. Um, and so that that's the only reason why. It looks like someone has also asked, can you discuss what would be preferable criteria for crisis standards of care? Sure, that's a great question. Um, and we eventually, you know, I, I said that we worked with a number of states to come up with less ageist um, policies. Um, and one of the solutions that we came up with was much more of a lottery-based system. So when you would go through the SOFA scoring and it turns out that you know, people um, have the same score that you would end up, instead of using age as a tiebreaker, you would use a lottery system um, to decide you know, based more on chance and less so on someone's just age. Um, who would get that resource? And you know, for folks who think, well, you know, shouldn't you also account for, um, you know, likelihood of survival and how long you would, you know, have to survive after COVID? A lot of that gets factored into the SOFA scoring. I mean, SOFA scoring is super technical, and I don't want to spend too much time on that. But that was already kind of accounted for in the formula um, around the scores that people would get, and then the crisis standards of care came in to say, well, if the if, Two people got the same score, then how do you break the tie? And what we would say is you should use non-age criteria to break the tie, including what some states would end up getting um, or doing is using a lottery-based system. Those were the only two questions I saw, but we can leave a couple more minutes if anyone wants to, if anyone pops up. I'll also say, you know, I know sometimes questions come up afterwards. So um, this slide includes my contact information. You can feel free to email me directly. And, um, you know, I don't know everything here, but can help um, also make sure that it gets before the right people on the right team here at Justice Naging or one of our partners um, in case it's out of our, our area of expertise. I'm going to go ahead and put the information in the chat, but it looks like it's it for now. So thank you, Denny. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. This webinar was hosted by the Legal Aid Association of California, also known as LAC. We are the membership organization for California's civil legal aid nonprofits. 
Our job is to advocate in the legislature, in the courts, and with the State Bar of California on behalf of the community of nonprofits that serve low income Californians. In addition to our online and in person trainings, LAC provides coordination and advocacy for increased funding to support organizations like yours. Thank you.